I want to take a few minutes now to review the basics of transcriptional regulation. And so a really important point to make is that in the human genome, as well as most complex genomes, uh, only about 2% of the genome actually codes for protein coding exons. And so obviously what that means is that 98% of the genome is non-coding. And so a big open question that we haven't been able to answer completely to date uh, is the question of what does the rest of the 98% of the genome do? And so what we've been able to decipher so far is that about 10 to 20% of the human genome is regulatory. Um, and so that means that it encodes roughly on the, somewhere on the order of a million regulatory elements. Those regulatory elements uh, include things like promoters, enhancers, um, insulators, uh, non-coding genes, and, and other types of elements. And so those elements are obviously involved in things like uh, precise control of gene expression, as well as in uh, helping dictate which genes should be turned on and off uh, to then uh, further define and distinguish uh, the different types of cells in the human body. And so as I mentioned on the previous slide, the major role of a lot of those non-coding elements in the human genome is to basically facilitate transcriptional regulation. So again, just to briefly review the process of transcription, typically transcription of uh, genes start with some set of chromatin regulators uh, that basically come in and in the case of activating transcription, uh, they typically uh, open up uh, chromatin and basically move, for example, histones around to increase the accessibility of, for example, the promoter and transcription start site. Um, such that they can be accessed by the transcriptional machinery. What then typically happens is that trans some transcription factors um, come in to bind to DNA binding sites um, that are either at, for example, distal enhancers or at uh, proximal promoters. Uh, transcription factors typically bind to open or accessible uh, DNA sequence. And so after transcription factors bind and, for example, help recruit the basal transcriptional machinery, uh, you basically get a complex of transcription factors forming, uh, which then eventually recruit RNA polymerase and enable a transcription to happen. And so just a quick uh, review of RNA polymerase. So again, the, ma the major goal of RNA polymerase is to basically facilitate transcription, where transcription is essentially copying a segment of DNA into uh, either coding or non-coding RNA. Um, RNA polymerase typically starts transcription at the transcription start site, which is uh, obviously close to the promoter of the gene. Um, and it's worth pointing out that there are three types of RNA polymerases, at least in humans. Uh, RNA pol one uh, is primarily involved in uh, generating ribosomal RNAs. Uh, pol two is responsible for the you know, vast majority of the uh, transcripts that uh, mature into mRNAs, uh, as well as microRNAs, and we'll talk later uh, in the transcriptal mix lecture what those are. And then there's also pol 3 which synthesizes a lot of the other kind of like smaller RNAs, um, like tRNAs or even like uh, other types of ribosomal RNAs and things like that. So RNA polymerase is really a, a general purpose complex. It's general purpose in the sense that RNA polymerase doesn't by itself somehow yield cell type specific and context specific gene expression. Um, it, it is, you know, by and large responsible for transcribing um, DNA into RNA but it relies on a lot of other cellular machinery, a lot of other transcription factors and chromatin regulators um, and other types, of, um, other types of regulators in order to really generate cell type specific gene expression. And so this diagram is basically just supposed to illustrate that um, RNA pull two interacts with a lot of other types of factors uh, in order to really start transcription at a given transcription start site. And so, uh, you know, this is going to be a really uh, frequently recurring theme in the class. Again, transcription factors, at least DNA binding transcription factors are, are proteins that bind 
either specific or not so specific DNA sequences there and basically affect transcription in either a positive or negative way. Uh, depending on how you count it or whether you define or whether you're counting DNA binding domains or whole transcription factors, there's roughly somewhere on the order of 3,000 transcription factors in the human genome out of the you know, 20 to 25,000 protein coding genes. Um, and it's worth pointing out that, you know, number one, only a subset of transcription factors may be expressed and floating around in the cell at any given point in time. And transcription factors, more importantly, are um, oftentimes uh, combinatorial in their, in their nature. And so what that means is that if you have two transcription factors present in a cell, um, they collectively might do something different than, um, they might behave differently than uh, if they were expressed uh, in isolation. And so um, basically they could work, for example, synergistically or antagonistically to, um, to yield kind of combinatorially different uh, types of outcomes uh, in terms of gene expression. And so it's worth pointing out that uh, a lot of people have spent a lot of time trying to figure out for each given DNA binding domain of a transcription factor, you know, what is the sequence that that particular DNA binding domain binds to. And so it varies quite a bit in terms of, um, you know, the particular family of transcription factors that you're looking at. But by and large, um, most uh, DNA binding domains, individual DNA binding domains, generally speaking, uh, recognize sequences on the order of four to six is probably the most common. Uh, but, to, you know, depending on whether you're talking about uh, DNA binding domains that uh, form dimers and so on, that kind of recognition sequence can run up to like 20 base pairs. And so these uh, transcription factor binding site preferences are typically represented as uh, what's called a sequence logo. So that's basically the, the big um, logo of of A, C's, G's, and T's that you see in the bottom right hand corner of the slide. Um, and so basically the idea is that uh, the x-axis kind of represents the position of uh, a given base in the recognition sequence and the height of the letter is kind of proportional to what's called the information content or in, in some sense the relative frequency of how often you see a letter at that given position in the binding sequence. And so the main point here, and one of the main reasons why understanding um, DNA binding transcription factor behaviors is so difficult is because these sequences are super short. And so this sequence you see here, for example, is only uh, eight base pairs long. And so if you think about it, uh, if, a DNA, if a given DNA binding domain uh, has a you know, sequence preference that's really only described by some eight base pair uh, sequence logo or a motif, um, then the chances of seeing that eight base pair sequence many times across the genome, even in places where you might not think that transcription factor should bind, uh, is actually really high. And so a huge problem in, term, in regulatory genomics is really understanding, kind of distinguishing, okay, even for, you know, for given DNA binding transcription factor, even though it could bind to you know, millions of places across the genome, in practice through some of the technologies that we'll talk about later in this class, um, a given transcription factor might bind, you know, only on the order of like hundreds of those positions or um, in the case of like master regulators, it'd be more. But generally speaking, we think that transcription factors bind to a lot fewer locations in vivo uh, than you might expect just based on looking at the sequence uh, preferences of these TFs. And so a big question is, you know, why, why is that? And so I briefly, briefly talked about promoters and enhancers. So here I'll, I'll kind of more clearly define what exactly they are and where they are. And so promoters are generally speaking, the, you know, the so-called upstream region of uh, DNA in terms of the transcription start site. And so promoters are typically found, you know, 100 to 1,000 base pairs upstream of the TSS. Um, and generally speaking, uh, encodes a lot of binding sites for, or a lot of, you know, sequences that are recognized by uh, factors that are associated with RNA polymerase. Um, and sometimes they contain sites that are more responsible for like tissue specific or cell type specific um, binding sites for transcription factors, but mostly it's promoters are, um, you know, more or less like general purpose and are 
involved generally in, in recruiting kind of um, less cell type specific or contact specific um, regulatory machinery that helps you start transcription. And so generally speaking, there are, you know, as many promoters, at least, uh, you know, as there are transcription start sites in the human genome, but many genes have more than one TSSs. And so in contrast, uh, enhancers are, are also <coughs> regions that are, you know, depend, you know, they, they can range in size, but they're typically 100 to, you know, 1 KB uh, segments. It's, it's worth noting that uh, some enhancers, you know, there's so-called super enhancers can, can stretch like tens of kilobases long. Um, and so these, you know, the size of these elements is still relatively small. Um, but the main difference with promoters is that enhancers can can really sit far away from the gene that they, or from the transcript and stored site that they interact with. And so people have found enhancers that act over like a megabase away on the genome, uh, which is really far. Um, kind of more importantly, enhancers uh, can be found actually upstream or downstream of the transcript and stored site. And oftentimes they're, um, they're kind of direction invariant. And so what that means is that uh, if you take like an enhancer and you like flip it in, flip it in direction, um, oftentimes it'll, it'll still work almost as well, or, you know, basically indistinguishably from the original orientation. Um, and so these enhancers are typically, uh, you know, they typically contain a lot of, uh, individual binding sites to gain of DNA binding transcription factors. Um, and enhancers generally act to increase uh, or enhance gene expression of their of their target promoters. Um, and so obviously one question is, well, how do these enhancers operate at such long distances? And so an example of a, a very simple mechanism it does so is through looping. And so here in the diagram on the bottom right, you can see that uh, even though the enhancer represented by the E box can be very far away from the promoter, the P, um, through looping, basically an enhancer can be brought into close proximity of the promoter and, and basically help recruit um, transcriptional machinery to that particular gene. And so here's just a kind of a classic example of a promoter and, and kind of regulatory elements that you might find uh, close to the transcript and start site. And so plus one in this on the x-axis basically represents the TSS. And you can see that there's kind of um, you know, there can be multiple regulatory elements, both immediately upstream and downstream of the TSS. And in contrast, here's an example of, of what an enhancer might look like. And so it also, again, is kind of rich in transcription factor binding sites. Um, it's also worth pointing out here that transcription factor binding sites don't, um, you know, they, they can actually overlap. And so you can have binding sites of multiple TFs uh, in close proximity overlapping. And what that functionally means is that, you know, why that happens is that um, it might occur in the case where uh, multiple transcription factors need to uh, synergistically interact in order to enhance uh, gene expression. Um, it can also, what can also happen is that you can have transcription factor binding sites of competing, uh, or you can have uh, DNA sequences corresponding to TFs that compete with each other. And so, um, you know, if one TF comes in and binds to its uh, binding site, it might actually occlude and prevent another TF from binding to that site. And so that kind of competitive behavior can lead to kind of, kind of some interesting transcriptional dynamics, depending on how, um, you know, depending on what the concentration of these TFs is in the cell at, at a given time. And so uh, again, uh, one of the points I want to drive home here is that enhancers can sit really far away in the genome. And so there's, there's been clear examples of, um, you know, in many different organisms where enhancers that act like a megabase away from the transcriptional start site uh, upon like mutation or deletion or some kind of perturbation can lead to various types of, of phenotypes in the organism. And so, for example, uh, in mouse, people have found enhancers where if you delete them, they, they lead to substantial reduction in the size of, uh, of a mouse, for example. And so it's pretty remarkable that even single base pair substitutions can have very large scale phenotypic effects on an organism. So here's an example of just like literally a single base pair substitution that can lead to malformations of different limbs um, in an organism. And this again is 
you know, probably corresponds to a single base pair change of one transcription factor binding site for one um, TF. And so these, you know, it's, it's really, it's really hard in general to be able to predict the effect of single point mutations or changes um, in the genome. Uh, and so that, that's why, you know, the study of regulatory genomics is, is really so difficult. So here's basically just a, a hypothetical example of, um, you know, a local region of a genome that has uh, two different genes, gene X and gene Y, that are um, expressed and functioned in different types of cells. And really here, the, the point of these diagrams is to illustrate how the same genome sequence can be used to, you know, express and turn on different parts of the genome at different times. And so here the main point is that depending on what type of cell you're in, um, you know, these, uh, the local uh, chromatin structure can basically change. So the conformation of the, of the chromatin can change in a way such that uh, in uh, cells that you find in the, in t cell types that you find in the eye, um, only the, you know, the, the chromatin is basically remodeled in a way that such that only regulatory elements that will help regulate the transcription of those I genes or of gene X um, basically function. And basically the, the chromatin models itself in a way such that gene Y is essentially shut off in the eye cell and vice versa for the brain cells. <laughs> 